Well, welcome to our uh, discussion on, on demonology, on the, the devil and exorcism and possession and all those wonderful, joyful subjects, uh, which you've probably no doubt seen in the movies. Um, first of all, I think we'll... Uh, I just wanted to begin with a quote from, uh, from Scripture. Brethren, be sober and vigilant. The, de the devil prowls round like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Stand up to him, strong in your faith. Now, this is how exorcisms and, and the whole phenomena of exorcism and possession and demons are handled in, uh, in the movies. Hopefully this works. Huh? that sound on? Let's try that again. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. This is taken from the movie The Right. Uh, and we'll, we'll meet the priest in the course of this discussion later on in another video. Sorry. This was taken at an exorcism in Turin. This man's jaw spontaneously dislocated while being read the Lord's Prayer. I like this movie because there's a Dominican in it. <laughs> but he doesn't do anything. <laughs> he gets the Jesuit to do all his work, so... <laughs> The movie's not playing very, very well. Then. There we go. Well, I'm not going to be doing any of that today. <laughs> the devil, hell, and even sin are subjects we rarely hear in sermons these days because they are too hard to talk about or they produce a type of faith which is set on fear rather than love. Nevertheless, the church has done itself a disservice in not discussing these subjects. 
It is quite clear from the scriptures that Christ himself was tempted by Satan, did battle with demons, as well he cast out demons as a sign of his authority over creation and as a means of initiating his kingdom of justice, love and truth, something which is totally anathema to the demons he confronted. Furthermore, Jesus gave this power to expel demons to his disciples. This is seen in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, and Mark chapter 6, verse 7. And they, no doubt, handed this authority on to their successors right down to our own times. It is ironic that Hollywood seems to discuss the demonic and the church's response more than the church itself. And this all started more or less in the late 60s and early 70s. Films like Rosemary's Baby and The Exorcist, to more recent films like The Exorcism of Emily Rose and the film we've seen the trailer for, The Right, uh, the, the phenomenon of the occult and its relationship to demonic obsession and possession has become in Hollywood, uh, dare I say it, normal. Today's talk will be in three parts. First, I want to all address, albeit briefly, the demonic and the occult in Scripture. Then I will pass on to the theological reflections of St. Thomas Aquinas and his understanding of spiritual beings. And lastly, I will explore the area of demonic obsession, possession, and the church's right of exorcism. Demons in Scripture. Belief in demons was a common thing in the ancient Near East. Many ethnic groups who surrounded the Israelite people would have been aware of these types of beings. Interestingly, the Old Testament rarely refers to demons per se. Really, uh, for the Israelite, evil as well as good, was sent by God or by his messengers who were punished by God uh, uh, to those who had committed sin. And this is seen in uh, 2 Samuel and in the book of Exodus. When we scan the biblical data, even the primary perpetrator of evil, Satan, was originally an obedient servant of God, sent to test men as is seen in the beginning of the book of Job. Or as found in the prophecy of Zechariah, we see Satan accuse human beings of wrongdoing. This office of accusing has also been seen, or is also seen, in the New Testament book of the Apocalypse, where Satan is given the rather innocuous name of the Accuser. The ghosts of the dead were apparently also seen as quasi-demons, with whom converse was strictly forbidden. That's the practice of what was called necromancy. Another idea about demons commonly held in early Judaism is that they were really pagan gods, the gods of, say, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, or the Egyptians, and these were enemies of the God of Israel. Post-exilic Israelites also believed in an evil spirit known as Azazel, to whom the scapegoat was sent out on the Day of Atonement. And so, on the Day of Atonement, the high priest ceremoniously placed his hands on this goat uh, and and thus transferring the sins of the people on this goat and then it would be sent out to placate this evil spirit known as Azazel. Later biblical and extra-biblical writings attest to the form of demons we are more familiar with, that is, beings who cause men physical harm, seducing them into moral evil, and they were also perceived of God as God's enemies. It was also in this time, in the second century BC, in the intertestamental Jewish literature, such as the Book of Enoch, that we see demons were fallen angels who consisted in rebelling under the leadership of Satan against God. And that's the sort of the the inheritance that has come down to us in the Catholic Church. Coupled with the belief in demonic spirits was also the practice of the occult in all its various forms. In fact, the topic of occult practice rears its head often in the Old Testament literature. And the reason for occult practice in in ancient Near Eastern Israel was for two reasons. Namely, to desire control over supernatural power or spirits, and secondly, the desire for knowledge that cannot be attained through ordinary means. In Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy, 
there are strong prohibitions against such practices as divination, soothsaying, augury, charming, wizardry, necromancy, consulting mediums, and sorcery. So too in the prophetic literature, particularly Isaiah and Ezekiel, we see frequent condemnations concerning the use of mediums and engaging in sorcery. And we go to the New Testament. The Greek word, e demones, occurs only once in chapter 8 of St. Matthew's Gospel. Other cognate words, such as to demonion, which is, means one devil, or ta demonia, meaning a plural, are also frequent in the New Testament texts. The Greek word daimon, which is where we get the word demon from, originally uh, was a number of, had a really a number of meanings, but it refers to, in Greek mythology, either a major or a minor god. But overall, the overall word daimon or demon uh, contained the notion of some sort of supernatural being or supernatural power. The two main concepts regarding demons in the New Testament refer to either an apocalyptic situation or the notion that they are pagan gods, uh, which carries on from the Old Testament. And this is seen in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. The New Testament is also primarily concerned with the moral aspects of the demons as those who tempt humanity and are hostile to humanity's spiritual good. A regular highlight of the Gospels is Jesus' frequent confrontations with evil spirits or demons who seek to create a kingdom opposed to that of God's. As well, there are important theological issues when Jesus confronts demons. For instance, the revelation of the messianic secret. So often we see uh, these demons refer to Jesus as the Son of God, uh, something uh, that he had not told anyone else. Uh, and so these demons uh, uh, know him and reveal uh, a knowledge which is hidden, which has not been revealed by anyone or Christ himself. And this, as we will see later on, is one of the earmarks of demonic possession. The phenomena of demonic possession is also seen in the New Testament data. Important incidents of this occur in the synoptic writers, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke, particularly in the story of the Gadarene or Gerasene demoniac. In this encounter, Jesus meets a young man who is possessed with a number of spirits. Our Lord asks the demons how many there are, and the response is, I am legion, for we are many. A legion was a segment of the Roman army comprom comprising of 6,000 men. The man is described in, the, in some of the synoptic gospels as having vast strength. And as we will see, uh, this is also a sign of demonic possession. His strength was enough to break the chains that were regularly used to restrain him. Furthermore, the man in his address to Jesus does not address Jesus as himself, but as the spirit naming itself legion. So the, the man doesn't speak to Jesus, but this spirit who possesses him. And he says this, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure thee by God that thou torment me not. In Matthew's account, the demon asks, Have you come to torment us before the time? This shows that they, they the demons, know they are doomed, but think that their judgment is too early. Another interesting encounter of demonic possession we find is in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 16. This particular incident of possession has its genesis in practicing occult arts. St. Paul encounters a girl who the writer of Acts says had been possessed by a spirit of divination. In this incident, the principle of desiring hidden knowledge through extraordinary means is illustrated, this being one of the two principles for engaging in occult practice I alluded to earlier. Paul and his disciples, whilst sojourning in the Macedonian town of Philippi, encounter this young girl who is a slave to some sorcerers or some people who are practicing the occult. And this practice, uh, which is evidenced in this girl who can obviously foretell the future or prophesy, brings uh, a revenue or an income to her, her, her owners. She's a slave. And so 
the following, uh, the, the, the girl says to, um, G, uh, to St. Paul and shouts out in a, aloud once again, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. It is of important note that the girl accurately understood who Paul and his mission were, much like the Gadarene demoniac knew who Jesus was and his mission. mission. And both of these stories highlight a power manifested by the possessed, namely the knowledge of hidden things. We move now to the second part of this talk, which concerns itself with the nature of demonic spirits. The Aristotelian Thomistic school of philosophy posits that there is a hierarchy of being in the order of things that exist. At its pinnacle, is the uncreated God, who has the divine nature, followed by created immaterial intelligences, which we commonly refer to as angels. Lastly, human entities have their position at the bottom of those entities which would be deemed as having the dual powers of intellect and free will. The rest of created reality, from higher primates to the smallest amoeba, do not have intellect or will in the same way as the divine, angelic, or human entities. Whilst other inanimate entities, like rocks, for instance, have no intellect or will. Personhood, in traditional Aristotelian Thomistic philosophy, is characterized by possession of these dual powers, namely of intellect and free will. Hence, only God, angels, or these immaterial uh, um, persons, and human beings are understood to have personhood, or are as regarded as persons. These spiritual beings, angels, are what we are discussing today. It is understood, as a matter of Catholic faith, that a portion of these angels, rather than use their free will to serve God, decided to serve themselves, and thus have seen the penalty of that choice bear fruit in their hatred they bear towards God and God's creation. The Catechism of the Catholic Church thus teaches about the angelic nature in general, and thus the nature of demons, saying, As pure spiritual creatures, angels have intelligence and will. They are personal and immortal creatures, surpassing in perfection all visible creatures, as the splendor of their glory bears witness. St. Thomas Aquinas, in his Summa Theologiae, writes about angelic knowledge, saying, An angel is called intellect and mind, because all his knowledge is intellectual. Both angels and demons do not need the senses to know things, like we do. We need to have our bodies to have an understanding of reality, of knowledge, the things of, that we need to know. We get them all through the five senses. Rather, these immaterial spirits uh, have immediately infused ideas from God. Nor do they grow in knowledge as we do. They have all the knowledge about things already given to them at the moment of their creation. Likewise, both angels and demons have a deeper perception of things and can predict things to happen not supernaturally, but because they have a more acute understanding of th how things are intellectually. The demonic, or the demons, are angelic spirits then, pure intelligences, infused with everything they need to know, given to them at the moment of their creation. Where the demon differs from the angel is that they have willfully and intellectually perceived another good other than God. Thus, they incur damnation immediately because they know more eminently what they have done. The major sin of the demons, however, is pride, because they wish their good be, more, be something other than God. As well, first, because God is, uh, as well, their other major sin, St. Thomas Aquinas notes, is envy. They envy man particularly for two reasons. First, because God assumed a human nature in Jesus Christ. Second, because men have the ability to repent and receive forgiveness of their sins, something the demons can never have. This is why demons particularly have it in for humanity, because of the grace of salvation. The demons then will do anything 
to deceive human beings into despair and give them the idea that they can never be forgiven their sins nor enjoy salvation. So how did these angels become bad? What happened? Well, this is a great speculation. There's nothing really in Scripture that we can point to. But the fathers of the church, particularly Gregory the Great, considered that Satan was the highest of the angels. And because of his bad example, many other lower angels followed him. Satan, Thomas Aquinas speculates, turned to evil not because he desired absolute equality with God, to be literally divine, since he always knew the unbridgeable gulf between creatures and God. Nor, Aquinas remarks, could Satan have wanted literally to be God, since that would have meant that he would have wanted to cease to exist as what he naturally was, an angel. But, Aquinas argues, it is not absurd to think Satan could have wanted the good of his beatific vision to be something due to him by right, or something deriving from what he was by nature, and not as a matter of God's free gift. So, in our theology of salvation, in our theology of creation, all created reality, particularly those that are persons, have their goal or their aim or their completion in the vision of God, in seeing God face to face without any, any obstacle. And this was also the reward of the angels. Satan, it, St. Thomas speculates, saw this as his right. I deserve this because I'm so good. You, I deserve to see you face to face. Rather than what it should be is that God doesn't need to reveal himself to anyone. Uh, no one has a claim on God because of, of who he is as, as infinite and, uh, and divine. And so everything that uh, we receive from God is a gift, including this final encounter with the divine in what's called the beatific vision. So all of us as human beings even are created for this beatific vision, that is to see God without any obstacle. And so Satan believed rather than giving, being given to him as a gift by God, because God didn't have uh, in justice uh, the obligation to give it to Satan or to any of us, uh, Satan believed it was actually due to him because of his uh, e excellence as a, as a being. And so we see this then as, as the genesis of, of uh, evil and of, of the uh, nature of these uh, demonic beings. It is further to be noted here that there is a hierarchy uh, even in this immaterial realm of spiritual beings. And at the top of the, the, the list are what's known as the seraphim. So it may be deduced that Satan was a seraph. This is followed by the cherubim, the thrones, the dominions, the virtues, the powers, archangels, principalities, and at the bottom, the little angels, probably like your guardian angels. Now, in hell, the hierarchy is kept. And so there are much stronger demons and much weaker demons. And this has been noted by exorcists in their, in their ministry that there are some demons that are more difficult to exorcise than others. And it might be, uh, as an analogy, it might be seen to be uh, like a, a, a tree. There are some trees, like a young tree, you can just basically rip out and it's pretty easy to get them out. But then there are some trees that have been there for many, many, many years. They've dug their roots in. It's much more difficult to remove uh, those trees because of the roots. And so too with these more powerful demons, they have, in a sense, uh, struck their roots into the person in a very firm way, and therefore the exorcist may have to um, minister to that person, the possessed person, more than once. Maybe some of these exorcisms, I understand, have gone on for years. Uh, so it's not just like in the exorcist or in the, the right where it's just, you know, this final confrontation and a, you know, a crucifix being put in your and screaming all that. Uh, in fact, it's not like that at all. And in fact, the, the exorcisms may go on uh, and the sessions may go on over a period of time. 
I will now move to the third part of this presentation, namely the phenomenon of demonic obsession and possession. Better move that on here. Normally, diabolical influence on the individual is restricted to simple temptation, although it is not likely that the majority of temptations proceed from the immediate and direct intervention of demons. So we can't say the devil made me do it, often. Most of our temptations come more or less from our own weaknesses, our weak wills, our desire for sensuality, which we need to discipline the only way to curb those tendencies is to discipline ourselves through fasting, prayer, and almsgiving, which we are currently doing, I think, in Lent. Uh, that's the reason why we have Lent, to discipline ourselves, to overcome temptation. But at other times, with God's permission, a demon may concentrate his power on an individual by means of diabolical obsession or diabolical possession. And we see here the three reasons or genesis uh, for these particular phenomena. Temptation is the ordinary way uh, we experience uh, uh, falling into evil. But then there may be reasons like uh, uh, growing in virtue. A person may be either possessed or obsessed by a demonic spirit as a means of proving their fidelity to God through trial. And this is why many saints endured demonic interference in their lives. Now, I haven't been able to come across the lives of any saint where they've been possessed as such, but there is a lot of data of demonic obsession with regard to the saints. Um, and this particular phenomenon may be uh, found within the tr tradition of the Catholic Church in its spiritual theology. And this spiritual theology is allied uh, particularly in the uh, familiar uh, understanding of the 16th century Spanish mystic Saint John of the Cross, who talked about the dark night of the soul, or the passive purification of the soul, where this person, uh, a very noble person, a very virtuous person, a saintly person, endures or engages in some final confrontation with evil, uh, which God allows, so that they are then proved uh, to be a friend of God, close to God, in union with God. And so God allows this final temptation, this final uh, phenomena to occur to a holy person, so as to show, to demonstrate their sanctity. And this has occurred, as I'll show you later on, to a number of saints, uh, particularly um, we know uh, from his own words and his own writings, St. John Vianney, who was a priest of the 19th century in a little town called Ars. Uh, another female saint, St. Saint Gemma Galgani, who was a 19th century saint who lived in Italy. And the uh, phenomena occurring around uh, Padre Pio, St. Pio of Petrolcina, who only died in 1968. Uh, and there was much mystical phenomena around him, including the so-called appearance of stigmata, visions, and in the case of Padre Pio II, uh, demonic obsession. However, the genesis of either obsession or possession may, and often does arise, from dabbling in the occult. In the great majority of cases, reported by both Catholic and Protestant exorcists, occult activity is the root cause of demonic disturbance. Recourse to tarot cards, fortune tellers, mediums, seances, Ouija boards, and the like seem, it would appear, as gateways for communion with demonic spirits. From the evidence of many seasoned exorcists, any kind of engagement with occult practices, no matter how innocent or how disinterested the participants may be, these activities open the door to entities that will seek to dominate and destroy your life. Mucking around with these things or experiences is no joke, and they are not to be engaged with even if the participants don't believe in it. So I'm only going on the anecdotal evidence, but this seems to be a, a major cause, engagement in, in uh, occult practice. Uh, and, and often this can occur, particularly with 
people about your own age or even younger where they find this kind of thing, you know, it's like telling spooky ghost stories. It's like the next rung up. Let's kind of, oh, let's see if we can speak to Auntie Hilda or something and you get a Ouija board out or get the glass. Or sometimes people make their own um, devices, you know, with pencils and all sorts of things. Maybe even using a normal playing pack of cards as tarot cards uh, has been done. All these dispose the person to some kind of demonic influence. And I'm not saying, okay, well, tonight when I use my Ouija board, the devil is going to come and get me. Perhaps not. But it may weaken your sense of reliance on God or on uh, reliance on, on, on the good that is out there for some other kind of knowledge or some other kind of advantage. And that's often the reason why people do this sort of thing. Um, engaging in occult activity, going and visiting a medium or something, because they want to know something that is hidden, something that is uh, perhaps to their advantage. It might be, um, will I pass this exam? Uh, will I fall in love with this person? Uh, will, you know, um, I get that, win that lottery ticket? You know, who knows? All of these things uh, are usually done for some kind of advantage in some way. So what is diabolical obsession? Diabolical obsession occurs whenever a demon torments a person externally and in a manner that is so intense that there can be no doubt about his presence and his action. In simple temptation, the diabolical action is not so evident, absolutely speaking. It could be due to other causes. But in true and authentic obsession, the presence and activity of Satan or some other demon are so, un, are so clear and unequivocal that the victim can have the least doubt of it. The, re, the person who is afflicted is aware of his or her, her own conscious activity and the government of his or her faculties, but it is at the same time clearly aware of the external activity of Satan or an evil entity who tries to exert violence on the individual. Obsession can affect the interior faculties especially the imagination or the external senses in various manner and degree. The actor on the imagination differs from ordinary temptation only by reason of its violence and duration. Although it is difficult to determine exactly where simple temptation ends and true obsession begins, we can say that when the disturbance of the soul is so profound and the tendency to evil is so violent that only, the only possible explanation lies in some external force, even when there is nothing evident externally. It is, it is certainly a case of diabolical obsession, and it can take many forms. Sometimes it is manifested as a fixed idea that absorbs all the energies of the soul. For instance, uh, particularly with things like um, anger, uh, being obsessed with hating someone, in a very, very extreme way. Uh, it can appear as lust. All, you, all, you, all that seems to consume your mind at all times is, is lust and, and, and sexual thoughts and, and these sorts of things. Doesn't help being an 18-year-old boy as well, but uh, normally, you know, it will give, you know, if the age is 18 or 19 or 20 or whatever, one can kind of understand. But if it's so intense that it kind of uh, uh, grips you, then it may be a, a, a case of, of diabolical obsession. We have to be careful here, though. We can't sort of say, oh, well, that's diabolic obsession. That's definitely diabolic. These things have to be very, very serious, uh, almost uh, perhaps like addictions, almost. At other times, the images and representations are so vivid that the subject feels that he or she is dealing with concrete reality. Again, it may refer to one's duties and obligations, towards which one feels an insuperable repugnance or it may be manifested by a vehement desire for something, for something one is obliged to avoid. It might be seizing someone's wife or husband or do it, getting something that you want that's not yours. This seizure has repercussions in the emotional life because of the intimate relation between the emotions and the cognitive faculties. The soul, even in spite of itself, finds itself filled with obsessive images that arouse doubt, resentment, anger, antipathy, hatred, despair, or dangerous tenderness and inclination to sensuality. 
The best remedies against such assaults is prayer, accompanied by true humility, self-disdain, confidence in God, the protection of the Blessed Virgin Mary, the use of sacramentals, that is medals or crucifix, holy water, and obedience to one's spiritual director. What's going on here? Bodily obsession is usually more spectacular, but in reality it is less dangerous than internal obsession, although the two normally occur together. External obsession can affect any of the external senses, and there are numerous examples of this in the lives of the saints, as I referred to earlier. The eye is filled with diabolical apparitions. Sometimes they are very pleasant, as when Satan transforms himself into an angel of light to deceive the soul and fill it with sentiments of vanity or comfort. By these and similar effects, the soul will recognize the presence of the enemy. At other times, Satan may appear in horrible and frightening forms in order to terrify the servants of God and to withdraw them from the practice of virtue, as one can discover in the lives of numerous saints. Or the demon may present himself in a lustful form or a voluptuous form in order to tempt souls to evil. Other senses besides sight are also affected. The ear is tormented with frightful sounds and shouts, with blasphemy and obscenities, or with unchaste or indecent songs and music to arouse lust. The sense of smell is sometimes perceives the most pleasant odours or an unbearable stench. The sense of taste is affected in various ways. Sometimes the demon arouses feelings of gluttony by producing a sensation of the most delicious foods or most exquisite liquors the individual has never actually tasted. But usually he arouses a more bitter taste in the food that is taken, or he mixes repulsive objects with the food so that it will be dangerous or impossible to swallow without disgust. Finally, the sense of touch which is diffused throughout the whole body, can be subject, subjected in countless ways to the, to the influence of the demons. Sometimes there are terrible blows upon the body. At other times, there are sensations of unchaste embraces or caresses. Or God may permit that his servant be tested by extreme experiences of sensuality without any consent on the part of the one who suffers these things. And one example I'll give you is of Padre Pio. Padre Pio was a Franciscan friar of the 20th century. He was born in the late 19th century in, uh, in, the place, in a place called Petrolcina in southern Italy. And he joined the, the Franciscan friars in the, in the early uh, 20th century, in about 19, the 1900s, early 1900s. And he took the name, uh, his real name was Peter, actually Pietro, but his uh, name in religion was Pius. And Padre Pio uh, was uh, subject to a number of uh, miraculous occurrings, both uh, divine and blessed, but also uh, demonic. And here in one of his writings, he writes to, through his uh, spiritual director, F Father Augustine, this, the demon or the devil appeared as young girls that danced. It appeared as a crucifix, as a young friend of the friars, as the spiritual father, or as the provincial father, as Pope Pius X, as the guardian angel, as Saint Francis, and as Our Lady. The devil has also appeared in his horrible forms with an army of infernal spirits. There were other times when Padre Pio was approached by the demons, but without any apparition. He was troubled. He was troubled, and he, and he said also that he was troubled with deafening noises and covered with spittle. Padre Pio succeeded in freeing himself from these attacks by the devil by invoking the name of Jesus. The struggle between Padre Pio and Satan became more difficult when Padre Pio freed the souls, the souls possessed by demons. Father Tarsicio of Cervinara, one of his acquaintances, said, more than once before leaving the body of a possessed, the demon has shouted, Padre Pio, you give us more trouble than Saint Michael. Also, 
Father Pio, don't steal the bodies from us and we won't bother you. This is the demon speaking through a possessed person. Obviously, Padre Pio engaged, perhaps, maybe, I don't know if he actually engaged in any kind of exorcisms himself, but may have prayed for these people. In one of the letters to Father Augustine, dated the January the 18th, 1912, Padre Pio stated, the demon does not want to lose this battle. He takes on many forms. For several days now, he has appeared with his brothers, who are armed with batons and pieces of irons. One of the difficulties is that they appear in many disguises. There were several times when they threw me out of my bed and dragged me out of my bedroom. I am patient, however, and I know Jesus, Our Lady, my guardian angel, Saint Joseph, and Saint Francis are always with me. And so we see in the lives of these saints, certainly this, this notion of diabolical obsession, this attack by demons from without, from outside the person, and sometimes in their internal senses. So not possessing them fully, but certainly uh, giving them uh, great difficulties uh, through this supernatural occurrence. Diabolical possession. Diabolical possession is a phenomenon in which a demonic spirit invades the body of a living person and moves the faculties and organs as if he were manipulating a body of his own. The demon truly resides within the body of the unfortunate victim and he operates in it and treats it as his own property. Those who suffer this despotic invasion are known to be possessed. So in a sense the demon enters the body and uses the body like a kind of a puppet. Um, it's important to understand here that the, the demon's presence is restricted to the exclusive use of the body. The soul remains free even if the exercise of conscious life is suspended. So often those who are possessed will say that they don't remember what's happened. They fall unconscious when the uh, demonic spirit uh, occurs, uh, normally in the exorcism, but then at other times. Nevertheless, the primary purpose of the violence of the demon is to disturb the soul and to draw it into sin. But the soul always remains master of itself, and if it is faithful to the grace of God, it will find an inviolable sanctuary in its free will. So the demon can't enter into the will of the person. What he can do is make the person, in a sense, despair of their salvation, uh, despair of God's love, uh, give them the idea that their sins can never be forgiven. And this all correlates very well with the biblical data of Satan and demonic spirits in the sense that they are there to accuse the person uh, of wrongdoing. Uh, and we all notice this in our own lives, those who are, us, who are Catholic, who are trying to practice our faith with some degree of devotion, we realise that when we do sin, we feel all the more... Uh, especially if we've been trying to acquire virtue and try to act in a virtuous way, and we've fallen, often we may hear the voice of the devil uh, echoing through our own conscience. Oh, you shouldn't have done that. Now look at you, you're damned. Oh, God doesn't love you. Uh, don't worry about going back to confession because you'll just do the same thing next week. And so th that, that spirit or that feeling or that, that essence is there to get us to stop practicing our faith, stop receiving the sacraments, stop engaging in any, any way with our faith, and moving away to this despair, which the devil, which Satan wants us to embrace, because then we're in a situation like him. When a person is possessed, there are two states in which they uh, normally um, find themselves in. There's the period of crisis and the period of calm. Um, and we see in the period of crisis, there's, a, there's certainly the, the demon becomes manifest. Do I have to stop? What? Breaking my concentration now. Um, normally when the, when the person's in a state of crisis, they uh, show all the classic symptoms we see on the, on the films, you know, epileptic-like seizures and uh, contorted face. Um, all that sort of thing, uh, maybe a, a voice that's projected which is not their own, and then some of these uh, particular 
um, uh, hallmarks of true possession. And the first one is knowing a language that, ha that they've, you've never learnt. Uh, so Marie starts speaking in uh, ancient Greek one day, then I have to get out my crucifix and holy water because I know she doesn't know ancient Greek. And I know she's not taking a course in ancient Greek at the university and I'm, and I'm suspicious. It can mean also if the person is possessed that the, the uh, exorcist may, I don't know, speak to them in a language they don't know. And if they respond in that language, and this is where an investigation has to occur if they do have knowledge of languages, um, uh, then you use a, try and use a language or try and will, will someone in who knows some really esoteric language like, you know, ancient um, Persian or something like that. Uh, you bring them in and if the person can speak that, then there's something supernatural perhaps going on. The other one is uh, perceiving hidden or distant things. So Marie, uh, she's my guinea pig for today, uh, Marie starts telling me things about my past that I've never told her. Uh, for instance, she knows that my first childhood dog was called Sally and that it was a golden, golden retriever, you know, uh, or that my dog just died the other day, even though I've never told her these things. Uh, that too may be a sign of demonic possession. And lastly, which I think is the weakest of, of, the, uh, of the characteristics, is this manifestation of, of um, superhuman strength. Um, now, if Marie, who I know is not doing weights at the gym, uh, and is in no, no uh, position to do anything uh, r remarkably uh, boisterous or, or superhuman in the way of lifting things, she's not going into CrossFit or anything like that, um, she starts lifting up one of the boys, like lifting over her head and throwing him around the room. I, I then have to sort of say, maybe we better ring the Vicar General because we've got something demonic on our hands. And so these are these signs of, of possession which accompany, and these are the signs that the church must have to, to engage in a solemn exorcism. Just because she looks ugly or she's you know, spitting all the time or using bad language or uh, you know, she may have just fallen in with a bad crew. Um, but if she's doing these types of things, then it's time for us to, to get in the exorcist. But this is where the church, um, in a sense, uh, is very, very cautious about this sort of stuff. It's not like, even the, no, even the guy who's the exorcist for the diocese is not the guy like, you know, he's not sort of putting an ad in the yellow pages. It's a very, very, you definitely have to have the de devil in you to get to see him. And this then has to come through a battery of psychological, psychiatric, medical tests before one may ring up the Vicar General and say, oh, I think we need to go and get an exorcist for Marie James. Um, she's showing some signs. Um, she'd have to go to, you know, we'd have to cover all the bases. And it's a principle of theology, uh, particularly dealing with miracles or any supernatural manifestation, is that we cannot attribute to a supernatural entity anything which we can explain naturally. So don't go on with other churches going on with these medieval kind of things and garlic and steaks and crucifixes. It's like the church is some sort of... The church is the first to be cynical about, um, about demonic possession. And I'll see in this video uh, the fellow who is uh, the subject of the film The Right. Hopefully this works. <laughs> Be careful, Michael. Choosing not to believe in the devil will protect you. How long have we got? I've got even another five minutes. Five minutes. Yeah. At the Hollywood premiere of The Right, there was the usual heavenly light shining on the stars and the. Can we make this go properly? Or the, the, the... Most unnoticed in the celebrity oh. crowd was Father Gary Thomas. So you are known as the exorcist. 
here. I am the exorcist, the mandated exorcist of our diocese. That's right. He is an honest to God exorcist. Do you believe there is a devil? Yes. And do you believe that this devil acts upon people? Correct. Two months in Rome. Back could that be? Father Thomas says, like the priest of the movie, he was trained in Rome in the ancient rite and has participated in dozens. It is all part of the push by the Vatican to make more exorcists available to the faithful because some in the church believe we are facing a rising tide of demonic activity, particularly in America, where millions are moving away from traditional faiths and looking for alternatives. People who can get themselves involved in or people who will go see um, uh, some kind of a fortune teller, or someone who will go to a seance, or they can go and they can learn how to channel spirits. A lot of people would tell you up front, look, I'm just playing around. Right. It's not a big deal, it's just for fun. Absolutely. And it's not. The greatest set of peace is God our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. I love it, it keeps going back to Pope Benedict. They started it, why does that? Simply put, he didn't do nothing. <laughs> about demonic possessions and profoundly shaped the public perceptions about this right. It was violent, lurid, unforgettable. Much of that movie was shot in the nation's capital near Georgetown University. These steps are featured in the film and they're still known to this day as the exorcist. I think we might leave it there. I'll just move on. Um, so, as Father Thomas has said, that the church doesn't just go into this, you know, blindly. It, it has to rely on medical science and, and, the, and the information from them before anything happens uh, in the case of this solemn exorcism. You can do minor exorcisms, and minor exorcisms are actually done in baptisms. Uh, but the solemn exorcism is this situation where there has to be documentation, it has to go to the bishop first, and then he has to then authorise the exorcist to do the exorcism. So it's a very long, drawn-out process. The priest who does the exorcism has to um, also engage in fasting and prayer, and he uses the ritual of exorcism, uh, which is still uh, around. I've got a copy of it if anyone wants to see it, um, in, in that particular ministry. And as I said before, he may have to do it a number of times. And so, this phenomena is a reality. You may suspend your judgment. It might be completely not the devil. But in our faith, we understand that there is these entities that do attack from time to time. There are anecdotes of it. There is a lot of um, experience of this within the church and even outside of the church and in a variety of churches and even in other religions and, and cultures. There is certainly uh, the, the aspects of the demonic uh, present in the world. But we need not fear in this sense that normally with demonic possession it's very rare. So don't expect to visit, have a visit from Satan tonight. Uh, just say your prayers. Uh, and that's the main thing, really, uh, to have confidence in God and have and confidence in his power that he will protect us. Um, and then if, if we do come to the time when we need to fight, then he gives us the power and the virtue to do so. So let's finish with a prayer. And we pray particularly to St. Michael the Archangel, who is the guardian uh, of, 
uh, us all, uh, and especially in the battle against Satan. Holy Michael the Archangel, defend us in the day of conflict. Be our safeguard against the wickedness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him, we humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the Heavenly Hosts, by the power of God, thrust into hell Satan and all the wicked spirits who wander through the world, seeking the ruin of souls. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, everyone. Hopefully that answers a few questions.